welcome back and happy Tuesday. We are here in London and I have the great opportunity to be with my former colleague and of course friend because of all of this, Liv Benesty, who is the head of business AML at Banking Circle. That's right. So this week we're going to be talking about the role of financial crime and financial services and all the different areas within financial services that it impacts. So but let's start with your new title. You've had some awesome titles over the years, working at big <laughs> banks and fintechs. Head of financial crime is, is exciting. So now when we're thinking about head of business AML, what does that actually mean? Head of financial crime is always, I think, personal favorite. I think people see mob bosses reporting into me. It's kind of a cool one. Head of business AML, I think it's interesting that it's been called this. It is effectively head of financial crime. Um, but I sit in what we call the first line of defense. So I report up through the commercial function. And I think by saying it's business AML, we're really pointing towards, yes, the importance, obviously, of risk mitigation and having all your controls in place um, and being market leading in that aspect, but also the commercial elements of what is having a strong AML function, a strong financial crime function look like, mm -hmm. if you're also being very cognizant of the customer journey and the customer experience, and how does having that strong risk mitigating function scale, how does it help you scale? Um, and become actually a driving force as part of that, I think is really important. And that's why this head of business AML really adds that focus to, to, to the title, I think. Well, and I, it's so interesting because I'm, I'm sitting here and thinking about the typical functions and, and AML and, and scale to me like seem like oxymorons. And so it's like how, so, that, so that's fascinating. So let's talk about the different aspects and, and impact areas of, of um, financial crime. So what, so from a banking perspective, because you've had some really cool roles at banks too, what does financial crime look like and what are the impacts as it relates to banks? I'll start there. So I think you know how it relates to any kind of financial services firm, there are obviously loads of commonalities. I think it was very different when I was working at a bank, um, especially given the bank I was, I was at City, it was an enormous institution, right? Um, and I started at City in 2009, I think. Um, when the fines were really picking up for AML and we were at the forefront of that in terms of being probably one of the largest dollar clearers, if not the largest dollar clearer, and I was doing correspondent banking. And AML is an entire industry within a bank in, its, in itself, especially then when you're trying to figure out you know, exactly how do we scale, how do yeah. we fix this, how do we do this for not just correspondent banking and not just transaction banking, but trade, but investment banking, how do you maintain consistency across all of that? And it's huge time warp. It's um, incredibly costly. I think we saw the budget triple. Um, mm. And so that it is different for a bank, or it was different at the time for a bank um, going through it at that stage, especially at, um, at the size of the number of customers they have and the kind of volumes that they're putting through. The operational element is something that takes a lot longer to implement, so having a good operational structure, having um, the right technology in place. All of that takes so much time. Yeah. And the, the, even the reg tech industry, I think, was much later to the game, is, is more recent years. Even if it was right at that point, how do you implement a reg tech solution in a bank the size of a city, a JP Morgan, a Boney? Mm -hmm. There's procurement, there's risk, there's so many different things. So they actually are facing, or I think have faced, greater challenges in implementing new technologies which yeah. can be used to help them and to help them scale in a way that perhaps startups might have more access to, they can start afresh, uh, they don't have the legacy systems, they can get their data right from the outset. I mean, we all know, you know, we're talking so much about big data and what that can do with AI and machine learning and all of that. Like, none of these technologies matter if your data isn't right, right? And for a large bank to get their data right, especially legacy data, it's impossible. So, so you brought up the, the startup side for a second. So let's let's look at that for a moment. You've also spent some time at, at fintechs, um, and so what? How does financial crime? What is the impact on the the fintech or startup side? I think it's probably you can look at it from two directions, right? So there's directly on the fintech itself. Um, most fintechs find that as soon as they open their doors, there's kind of this immediate attack, um, from either from a fraud perspective or. or other forms of financial crime, but particularly from fraud, there's an assumption that your systems won't be up to up to scratch, or that at least you don't know what normal looks like. So if you don't know what normal looks like, you don't know what abnormal looks like, so you can't actually track it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of fintechs, when they first start, kind of get hit. Um, so there's obviously the economic loss to them. There is what that does to their operations. The, um, the cost just of setting up and having to have everything in place. A lot of the, the expenses will come from managing your risk, managing your compliance mm -hmm. controls. But then there's the other side of um, 
Unless you're a fintech that's gone direct out to get your own banking license, which is still, you know, not yeah, the far norm. between. Not easy. Yeah. Uh, not easy, even in the UK with, with the regulator that we have, let alone with what's going on in the US and, and national bank charters, etc. But if you are a fintech um, and you don't have a banking license, then inevitably you have to have a bank account and you have to run off the rails of a bank. And I think this was something that initially in the fintech wave, everyone was kind of forgetting, like, oh, it's the end of banks. No, it's not. There is always a bank at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, and the scrutiny that those banks will place on fintech, who they see as this huge risk, um, which is interesting of itself. We can get into a different discussion about whether you know, they represent more risk than a yeah. traditional correspondent banking model, having done that for six years. It's, a, it's <laughs> an interesting debate. But the risk that fintechs were seen as, as presenting to a bank, um, they are new, they haven't got, do they have the tools in place? Do they know how to use them? Do they know how to due diligence their, their clientele? Um, the perception of that and that relationship and how you maintain that relationship with your bank, I think, is an even, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say bigger, but it's definitely at least of equal concern. So how do you manage your risk and the perception that your bank has of you versus how you're actually doing it internally to protect yourself? Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I, um, risk is not an area that I spend too much time in, and I've never been as engage and excited about risk and hearing someone so passionate about Such risk and <laughs> financial an crime nerd. <laughs> as, as you. So if there, what do you, like, if you would say one thing that um, is going to be game changing in the future as it relates to financial crime and AML and all these things, like what, what would that look like to you? I think it's to do with the data and how we share it between ourselves. I don't even think it's an internal thing. Um, there are a lot of regs around data sharing, information sharing, particularly once you already have suspicions of transactions um, being outside the normal, potentially suspicious. Um, at the moment, a lot of that data really stays in-house and you have no means of, or limited means of going out and finding out more information from your peer institutions, right? So if I have somebody apply for, and I mean, not at Banking Circle with B2B, it's a different model, but let's say that some of the retail banking um, platforms that are out there all have applications for an account by either the same person or someone with the same face on multiple different identification documents in one day. Mm -hmm. If there was this kind of umbrella power that was all seeing that could look down and they could point to that and say, oh, that's really suspicious. But we don't have the ability to share that data right now. Or once they're already clients, they get into the bank and they are using um, a growing technological ecosystem to move money around. They don't need to do that within one bank. I mean, it's not, you know, you saw the Madoff thing at JP Morgan, so much of what he did across his entire network, his entire scheme was within JP Morgan, and that's an enormous bank, and, and yeah. you can't find the connections there. Now there are multiple different financial institutions that you can look at, um, right from your startup um, Neo Bank, all the way up to your large institutions that are banking them, with intermediaries in between. I mean, that's how global finance works. It's intermediary mm -hmm. after intermediary after intermediary. If we aren't sharing that information properly, either because we can't from a regulatory perspective, or we can't from a technological perspective, um, we're stuck. We're, no, we're never going to move forward. And so I think ways in which we can access data and share that data, both technologically and from a regulatory perspective, will be what, what actually moves the needle. And until then, I think we're going to be a bit stuck. Awesome. Liv, you are incredible. Um, please click on the link below to see more about what's happening in financial crime. Liv's background, she's done a little bit of everything. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what comes from here. Thanks for having me. Until next week. <laughs>